The scripture reading today is from Matthew 26, verses 36 through 44. Pipe down, everybody. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch with me. And he went a little beyond them and fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, So you men could not keep watch with me for one hour? Keep watching and praying that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away again a second time and prayed, saying, My father, if this cannot pass away unless I drink it, your will be done. Again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them again and went away and prayed a third time, saying the same thing once more. Good morning and Shabbat Shalom. What a wonderful day. Is this on, Chuck? Okay. What a wonderful day, and, and it's such a privilege this morning to have our guest speaker here. I'm so excited, I can't tell you. Daniel Amari, if you don't know anything about him, Daniel is one of Olive Tree's supported shlichim, or our sent ones, our missionaries. He's a full-time minister with a continuous flame and has a Master of Arts in New Testament from Trinity Divinity School. Daniel is the author of several books, including Presenting the Gospel to Muslims and Cradle of Islam. Daniel will share more about his ministry, so please welcome him. Daniel, come on up. And also, please, there's more books available to everybody today who's interested. God bless. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you for inviting me to speak and share uh, with you. Uh, and this is a great privilege to me. I'm very, I feel at home. I feel among family and friends. And uh, this is wonderful. So I was asked before I share the Word of God that I would actually um, uh, talk to you about an update for the ministry, what the ministry of the continuous flame is. I don't know if... Uh, uh, the slides are turning. Um, so, all right. So, what is the ministry? Uh, let's see, maybe, yeah. What's the purpose of the ministry? It's to present the gospel to Muslims utilizing all mediums in all languages to present the gospel to Muslims. And by the way, I'm very excited to see my family here. I see uh, uh, my brother Fadi and uh, my sister Damaris and their ch children, David and uh, Abigail. And uh, that's wonderful. Um, so basically, the vision of the ministry is to present the gospel to Muslims, utilizing all mediums in all languages but also to equip believers to present the gospel to the Muslims effectively. Um, you know, it's not just that we present the gospel. I mean, the real purpose is to equip all believers that they also will present the gospel uh, possible. And so we do this one three ways. The first way is through prayer. We, we believe that it is not possible with human efforts. Um, it's, with, it's only with the Spirit of the Lord. 
only with the Spirit of the Lord that we are able to do anything at all. Uh, and so this is very important. And so the first thing we do is through prayer. And one important thing is the September prayer conference. Uh, we have every year a prayer conference in September. And we would love to see some of you uh, join us if you are, want to spend the time focusing on prayer and praying for close countries and prayer for revival to happen in our, our nation. Um, the second thing is research. We would like to present the truth to Muslims, but this, we want to present the truth that is founded on facts and founded on good research. And so we have uh, something called uh, the Islam in Light of History series that is, consists of multiple scholarly books that we're working on. And so um, we have uh, three books right now that we are ready to be published and we are praying for them to be published. One of them is called Quran and History. So it compares the Quran with history and it shows basically the truth about the Quran, that the Quran is not a historical book. If you look at the, if you look at the scriptures, and if you look only, only to the old covenant scriptures, they are supported by over 25,000 archaeological sites or artifacts. I mean, this is amazing. This is overwhelming. Now, the Quran, no, it's supported with zil, nada. And, and it's very important to point this one to, to Muslims. They, they need to know. They need to know that the scriptures that we hold in our hands is supported with history. It's, com it's consistent with archaeology, and, and, and we can talk about it, but not the Quran. Now, the second book is Star Akbar. It's called The History of Allah. And this is very important, very foundational, because what Allah is, according to Muhammad and according to the Quran, is not the God of the Bible. It's not what our ancestor, the Jewish people, worshipped. It's not what Abraham and Moses worshipped. They're two distinct deity. They're not related to each other. And the other book is called The History of Mecca. You know, there's always, the devil always tries to confuse and distort, and it's taken the focus from focused on Jerusalem to focus on Mecca. And there is a parallel between them, and it's intentional by the devil. And so this is very important that we understand that Mecca has nothing to do with Abraham, has nothing to do with Ishmael. Mecca is um, a relatively a more recent city, in historically speaking, but Jerusalem was there. And Jerusalem is where the Lord purposes are in. In the past, during Yeshua time when he was incarnated, and in the future, the Lord has purposes for Jerusalem, not Mecca. And these are very important foundational book. Now, the other item is um, that we are, I'm still working on is Star Akbar, the, the attributes of Allah. As I'm, I'm showing basically in this book, this is my dad's book, and he's showing basically in his book that the attributes of the Lord is not the same attributes of Allah. They're very distinct. Uh, I'm not going to take too long to talk about these sub subjects. Maybe we can talk later because I really would like to share with you a message from the Lord to enrich our lives and to be encouraged. Uh, finally, outreach. Uh, we will, we, uh, outreach is um, we, we're trying to do translation projects and we have translated uh, several books to Hindu, Hindi and Urdu. Um, and so um, we translated two books to two languages. And, and this is very important because Hindi and Urdu are, um, there are hundreds of millions of Muslims who actually speak these languages. Um, the amount of, the number of Muslims that actually uh, speak the Arabic language is only 18%. 82% of Muslims don't speak the Arabic language. They speak other languages. And the most common languages that they speak are Urdu and Hindi, and so we are trans translating these books to these languages. And here's a pictures of them, and they are available for free on our website uh, to be downloaded and to be distributed. And um, we have uh, other, way, other mediums to, to share, uh, videos, tracts, journal, articles, social media, online classes, seminars, so these are other mediums that we're working on 
or we have available or we're praying for, for sure we need your prayer. Now, one thing that I want to say last is about and the vision. Um, our, over many years, we have come to learn that fellow believers, local congregations, missionary, and even Christian apologists need more than Islamic resources. We have given them Islamic resources. They need something more. And um, I, I tell you why they need something more. And one important event in 2023 that really affected all of us and it's, it brought to us important memories is October 7. Let me tell you why October 7 is important, and, and probably I'm preaching to the choir here, but listen to me. So analysts say October 7 is the worst catastrophe that happened to Israel since 1948. That is correct. But it is the worst catastrophe that happens to the Jewish people since the Holocaust. It is difficult to not remember the Holocaust when you're looking at the difficult, evil, and hard event of October 7. Now I'm going to bring you to another point, some statistics, some information that I observed. We know that militant Muslims they rejoiced in October 7. They said some of the most cruel words in praising Hamas and praising October 7 events. Now, the thing that was maybe surprising is moderate Muslims supported them. For moderate Muslims in all the nations, they woke up in all the nations, and I'm listening to them in their languages, they they did fail to condemn October 7. They supported Hamas. And we're talking about this is before Israel started attacking Gaza to get rid of Hamas. This is the first 10 days. Israel did not do any, anything against Gaza. They were waiting. They were preparing. They didn't do anything. So in the time of October 7, in the 10 days, moderate Muslims, they supported Hamas, and they hailed October 7. Now, of course, there are exceptions. but. Now, here's something even more surprising, more shocking for me. Muslims who became atheists or agnostic, they also supported Hamas. So, let me give you an encouraging word. Those Muslims who left Islam and they became believers in Yeshua, they very consistently condemned Hamas condemned October 7 and supported Israel consistently, very clearly, and more vocally. Those, I, I am telling you, there is something very important. There is nothing can change life except, except the gospel of Yeshua. It's very important to present the gospel to Muslims. Don't think basically that just basically you, 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 you make a Muslim moderate or even let them leave Islam to atheism, that's good enough. That's not good enough. Only the gospel can change a life and can open the eyes and can make persons stand on the truth. And, and, and without a shadow of a doubt, I'm looking at all of these Muslims who became believers in Yeshua, right? They, and they stand with Israel. They are the first to condemn Hamas. They are the first to support Israel even right now, even today. And this is wonderful. Now, and, and so that's the reason we are, there's a book that we call it the missing link. And that book is the gospel, presenting the gospel to Muslims. Presenting the gospel to Muslims. And I encourage every single one of you to actually read this book. I have a books, a gift from me to you. There's all the way in the back. If you don't have a copy, please take a copy for your family and read it. Uh, this is very important. And uh, also, it, it, we ask for your prayer. This is a very important ministry, and it's becoming even more impo important ministry in an age where we are living in anti-Semitism, where anti-Semitism is increasing big time. And not only anti-Semitism, it's fueled by Muslims. It's fueled by Muslims all over the world. And, and so the answer to it, what's the answer to this? Is the answer is to present the gospel 
to Muslims. And, and we need your prayer, brothers and sisters. We need your prayers. So let's go right now in, in, in time and prayer and, and lift our, our hearts. Heavenly Father, we come to you in worship and in adoration because you are awesome, you are our God, you are our Father. You know our request before we ask, and in eternity you set your love upon us. You loved us. And thank you, Lord, because you have blessed us with every spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Yeshua. And that's the reason we are here today. We are here to admire and to worship and to rejoice in you. Father, as we're praying for this, we, we pray, Lord, for Israel, Lord. And we pray, Lord, for the Muslims that they, the gospel will come to them and will, many will come to you and they worship you. And they we abandon the life of hate and they they embrace the love that is in the gospel. And Lord, at the same time, Lord, we pray for this congregation, that this congregation will stand for the truth, will stand in worship, and stand in the gap. And that, Lord, we, you know the families here, you know the individuals, you know the needs of everyone. So, Lord, we come to you. We ask you, Lord, to hide me behind the cross and that you will be speaking to us speaking to every person lord i pray lord that i will not be an obstacle but i will be a, an open channel for the holy spirit to touch every person according to their need and according to what you want to speak lord lord lift up our eyes so yeshua alone will be glorified and yeshua alone will be lifted up right now for the sake for his sake only and his glory we pray amen in the passage passage that we have read. Uh, Yeshua was passing through the most difficult trial possible, humanly possible. And he set before us a pattern how to deal with difficult trials in our lives. Let me tell you something. Part of the Christian life is passing through the most difficult trials. The more you obey the Lord, the more difficult the trial is. The more you serve the Lord, the more difficult the trial is. I personally came to the conclusion that if somebody is serving the Lord and he is all for the Lord and more consecrated for the Lord and there is nothing, no, no trials, maybe there's a question mark. The more you serve, the more trials. And, and, so, and, and you look over here at the events that are happening. In around us, the events of the world and the attitude of the world against those who believe in Yeshua and those people who will believe in Yeshua in the future. You know, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's something going on. The, the amount of persecution is increasing. The more the trials are increasing. But the trials is not only the persecution. The trials could be uh, health, financial, family situation, family breakup and uh, listen I'm not telling you that every trial is because of our good choices some our trial because of our bad choices but when we are serving the Lord uh, there are certain trials that come from the Lord and the Lord himself Yeshua he suffered the most difficult time possible and so I want to present to you five points, a pattern that he set before us so we will follow him, we would learn from him. So let's read from, I'm going to read right now from verse 36 to 38. Then Jesus came, the Yeshua came with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he told his disciple, sit here while I will go over there and pray. And he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee with him, and began to be grieved and distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch with me. Clearly, this is the greatest trial ever in history, history of mankind. And it is an example for us for dealing with our trials. 
the deepest sorrow mentioned in this text. The kind of sorrow, sorrow unto death, reflects the greatest suffering that Yeshua was going to pass through. We have to pay attention to the pattern that he intentionally set before us with, deep, with dealing with the deepest sorrow that comes from the deepest trials. And as I said, believing life, believer's life is not without sorrow. The more we follow the Lord, the more we, the more we obey the Lord, the more sorrow we will encounter. And the first of the five elements of the pattern is to pray. Look at this. The text says, sit. He, he took with them Peter and Zebedee, and he said, sit here while I go over there and pray. And pray the answer to the trial, the answer to the sorrow is to pray. To pray. In the response of the deepest emotions, we ought to pray. But furthermore, furthermore, notice how he took Peter and John and James to pray with him. So in the response of deep emotions of others, in the, in the response of the trials of others, we also ought to pray with them and have sympathy and empathy for them. Um, my question to us, are we praying? My question to us, are we praying for others? What is our reaction when we feel that there is a problem in our congregation? Do we, do we have a heart of condemnation or our attitude is prayer? Look at the pattern over here. The pattern is Yeshua asked Peter, James, and John to pray, to pray for. And, and so we have, a we have an obligation, obligation number one, that we pray when we are Suffer, we are suffering, but that if we are not, or even we do, we pray for others. That's number one. Uh, let's go to number two. And so I'm going to go to verse 39. He went a little beyond them, Yeshua went a little beyond them, and fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, Yet, not as I will, but as you will. I submit to you that this is the greatest prayer in Scripture. It's the greatest prayer in Scripture. And sometimes we don't do it, it give it its due. We don't give it its respect. The way we deal with it is we try to start to think, how can we explain it away? How can we um, look at the will of the Father and the will of Yeshua and, 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 and talk about... Hold on. This is important discussion, right? But let us not miss the point that in the response of the greatest trial and the greatest sorrow, this is the greatest prayer. And if this is the greatest prayer, we need to pay attention to it we need to model our prayer according to it. And we need to, to go into it and mediate in it and, and extract the treasures that's in it. And so I'm going to go spend some time a little bit and, 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 and go, you know, section by section. So number one, look at this. He fell in on his face. He fell on his face. And, and so one commentator, Leon Morris, says, with this prayer, the lowliest posture was adopted. It's an attitude of humility and submission. It's very important that we adopt humility when it comes to our own trials. 
and to the trials of others. The second thing, he says, my father, my father. These are the first words. The first words he appealed in the prayer was the deep personal relationship with the father. And, and so he taught, the, the Lord taught us about the father, taught us that the father knows our requests before we even ask him. He knows about our trials before we can put before them. He fully understands. It tells us that our father, that though we are as earthly parents, though we are evil, we know how to give gifts to our children, how much more our Father gives us good gifts, better gifts, better gifts. It's not, it's not like basically the Father says, hey, I'm not going to do anything about your life. I'm not going to touch anything about that thing over there. I will wait over there, and I will see, wait for you to pray, and when you pray that perfect prayer, only then I will do something for you. That is not the teaching of the Scripture. The teaching of the Scripture is something different. The teaching of the scripture is God, work, all things, all things, no exception, to those for good, to those who love, love him. And, and so you, there is some important theology about this one. The reason he used the word to those who love him is not a conditional. It's not to, all, to those believers hap, that happen to love the Lord. That's nonsense. The reason... The text says to those who love them because the, 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 the scriptures of the new covenant are based on the scriptures of the old covenant. The books of the old covenant, he described Israel as the, as the one he loved, right? So when he says he works all things for good to those who love him, it means he works all all things for good for his children because he loves his children. He is reminding us that we are the people of the covenant. We, he is reminding us that he loves us and that he is our children. And so when you look at about our text over here, which is very important, the text says to us that, that the pattern is we appeal to the Father, the Father who knows about our trials and the fathers, let me put it another day, who ordains our trials, who ordains our trials. Don't think that this is random that's happening to you. No, it's not random. Nothing random happens to God's children. The Lord is sovereign. The Lord is in control. And all of the things that are happening to you is because God has ordained them and God has a purpose and God will work all things for good. My Father. And look at, look at the next part. part. It says, if it is possible, you know, will not present anything that is against the will of the Father. Will not present anything against the will of the Father. And that, that's an example for us. When I pray, I should be careful that what I adopt for my life the action that I take for my life, the thing, the goals that I set for my lives, especially during difficult trials, are compatible to the will of the Father. Compatible to the will of the Father. Compatible to Scripture. I, I tell you, I tell you something. During the most difficult trials, this is when a person tempted to take an action that is against Scripture. And I'm talking about the people who are believers, people who, are, um, who, who, who follow the Lord, who have been with the Lord for a long time. And I'm telling you, this is the time where they are tempted to take an action against Scripture. You should say, Lord, I want my thoughts. I want my actions. I want my things to be according to Scripture. Nothing, I, I don't want to be any incompatibility. And, and this is very important. Now let's go to the next part. If it's possible, if it be possible that this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Christ.
Christ made his requests. But Christ made an important request, and I will let D.A. Carson say it. I don't like to quote a lot of people, but this one I have to quote. All things are possible with God, and so, if it's morally consistent with Father's redeeming purpose that this cup be taken from Yeshua, that is what he deeply desires. Pay attention. But more deeply still, Jesus desires to do his Father well. But more deeply desires, Jesus, Jesus desires to do his father was. And I, I, I tell you something very important that one we have to, oh, to pray. That changed my prayer. Here is two extremes. One extreme is to say, this is what I want. Lord, give it to me. Another extreme is to go over here and say, oh, I'm not going to say anything I want. I, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to keep it empty, you know. Lord, do whatever you want. I think that biblical balance that scripture taught us is to do the following to put say lord this is what i want if it's not con as long as it's consistent with your will this is what i desire this is what i desire for my health this is what i desire healing this is what i desire for my finances this is what i desire for my family this is for my desire for my children this is what i desire for my spouse but what i desire more is your will so it's if your will happen to be something different no 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 i don't want them i want your will first that should be our daily prayer that should be our focus of our prayer yes say i want to be healed say i want my family to be restored but come and say it to the point over here it says listen lord what I desire more than all of these things, I desire your will. So if your will that I will not be healed, I don't want to be healed. If your will that you will not give me the financial success, I don't want the financial success. If your will that I will be starving today, I will choose to be starving today. If your will that you will not give me the most important thing that are the basics, the basics in the relationships, the basics of husband treating wife and wife. If you don't give me this, I want your will. I don't want. I desire your will above all, and I want nothing but your will. And, and this is the biblical prayer, and this is very important to to pray this one daily. Now let's go to the the next element, and and. And, and look at this. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So you men could not keep watching with me for one hour. You couldn't keep watching with me one hour. Commentators. Maybe I should read one of the commentators. I would, I would like to read for you Matthew Henry. How short a time it was that he expected it, but one hour. They were not set upon the guard whole night, as the prophet was in Isaiah. Only one hour. Sometimes he, Yeshua, continued all night in prayer to God, but did not then expect that his disciples should watch with him. Only now when he had but one hour to spend in prayer. I tell you, brothers and sisters, this verse puts an expectation for us that we pray one hour every day with the Lord. One hour. The commentators agree. There's an expectation. How much do you pray? Oh, pray five minutes. I tell you, um, when pass passing through difficult trial, five minutes will not cut it. There is the anguish of the soul. There is the struggle of the mind. There is the cycle that goes again back and forth. And there is the hurt. And there is 
the struggle with the will of the Father. One hour. You ought, we ought to spend one hour. I, I tell you, the most difficult time you're passing through, this is the time when you need to spend one hour with the Lord. One hour in prayer. Spend one hour with the Lord every day, especially if you are passing through difficult trial. The next element, keep watching and praying so that you do not come into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So in my time in which I was spending one hour, I noticed that my flesh when I'm talking about my flesh, I'm talking about the sinful nature that we in us. Was giving me every single excuse not to pray for one hour. Let me give you some of the excuses. Daniel, you are tired. Um, it's very hard to pray for one hour. Physically, it's difficult. Now, for me, in order to pray for, pray for one hour, I notice that the moment I am awake, I have the amount of errands that I have to do for my daughter, preparing breakfast, um, preparing uh, lunch, take, them, take her to school. Uh, then I come over here, the amount of emails and, and work and ministry work, and you have to read scripture and you have to do the preparations. and. And suddenly you, you look at your, oh, this is a lunchtime, so you have to prepare some lunch at home. And then you prepare lunch, and then there is work, and then you look at, oh, this is the time to pick from school. And from school there is homework, and I mean, the amount of work that is over here, there is no way. So I, I found, I prayed about it, said, Lord, I want you to help me. And, and I decided to wake up very early, maybe 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock in the morning, every morning, and pray my hour, and then go back to sleep, but I, at least I reserved my one hour. That cannot be taken from me. Now, at that time, when I wake up, imagine wake up at three o'clock in the morning, four o'clock in the morning. My body says, Daniel, how about you stay and just sleep the whole thing? And I have done something like this by the, in, the, in the past. I remember my, so I don't have a good example when I was in college. One day I was given the option in my mind, Daniel, wake up early to study because there's an important uh, midterm and, and, and just one hour to study and, and then you will do great in the midterm and, or, and I said, no, I'll sleep. And I slept and I failed the midterm. But the point is like this, uh, sleep is valuable, right? So there is one thing is, is, is this, this, the, the sinful nature always convinces you to, to, to try to, to not to pray for one hour. Uh, and, and but amazing the moment I wake up suddenly it's okay and the, the sleep is gone from me and there's no problem so it's really a spiritual uh, uh, war warfare uh, another thing is the, the sinful nature tells you it's five minutes is okay five minutes is okay you don't have to spend one hour but the scripture says couldn't you spend with me one hour one hour okay and another way it says, uh, you sit over there and your mind is overwhelmed. You're, so, so clearly there is a struggle that is going to continue on and that struggle. And so what does it mean? It means we have to depend on the grace of the Lord. Lord, I cannot do it. I can do it. You're asking me to spend time with you. I, can, I, I admit, I come here, I admit, I can't do it. I need your grace. I need your grace, and, and, be, and only your grace can allow me to do what you need to do. Now, the next element, and the final one. He went away again a second time and prayed, saying, My father, if this cup cannot pass away unless I drink from it, your will be done. Again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy, and he left them again, and he went away and prayed a third time, saying, the same thing once more. The same thing once more. I, I tell you something. 
These words, not my will but your will be done, are extremely powerful. Extremely powerful. Their value shines, the value of the words, during the greatest trials. Indeed, only through difficult trials that one begins to comprehend the meaning and dimensions of the Lord's own words. And only then begin to apply them meaningfully to himself or herself. This is a significant diamond that one acquires during the trial. But notice that when Christ, how Christ went again and again praying the same exact words. And you could tell me, well, isn't it enough that the Lord would pray it once? Okay, he just said it. Fine, move on. I, 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 do you know why? Because this is a pattern for us. Praying, not my will, but your will. This is a major struggle because left to my own devices, the path that I will choose is this path because this path reflects what I want, what my demands, what my conditions, what my requirements. But the Lord has a different path for me. It has a path of humility a path of submission to his scripture, the path of sacrifice, the path of abandoning my rights and what I think is right, and abandoning all of these things and, and embracing the Lord's direction for my life and the Lord's will for my life, right? That's a major struggle. Don't think that you can pray it once. Don't think you can spend, I can, oh, well, I spent one hour with the Lord, and in that one hour with the Lord, I got the victory, and from now on, I'm, I'm going to follow the... No. No, 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 no. You have to, we have to spend on daily basis to struggle with the will of the Father. Because this is the truth. Lord, again, I want to do this, I want to do my way, because I, I, I want my way. I want my way. But... You have taught me that I desire the will of the Father more than my will. And therefore, Lord, I come back to you. Not my will, but your will be done. This is, there's a call for perseverance. There is a call for perseverance here. And we are called to persevere, for perseverance in every, every aspect of our life. Ironically, submitting to the Father's will in accepting the pain of the trial and the difficult consequences that entails brings us greatest comfort and consolation. It is our declaration of our trust in our Heavenly Father that He is working all things for good. Submitting to the will of the Father is the recognition that behind every trial there is glorious purpose that is worth it. If you think that insisting on your way is going to give you the happiness that you want, you will be greatly mistaken. But submitting humbly to the will of the Father will bring you to the glorious purpose that the Father has for your life. I'm going to end with a quotation. I want you to pay attention to it. This is from D.A. Carson. In the first garden, not your will, but mine, changed paradise to desert and brought man from Eden to Gethsemane. Now, not my will, but yours. Yes, it brings anguish 
to the man who prays it, but transforms the desert into the kingdom and brings man from Gethsemane to the gates of glory. I want the glory. I desire the glorious purpose that God, that God the Father has for my life. Yes, I don't want to miss this. And therefore, Father, not my will, but your will be done. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you, Lord, seeking your grace first and foremost. Because these are difficult words. The ramification of them are difficult. The trials, the pain. But Father, we trust that you work all things for good for your children that you love. We trust that you are behind the trials. We trust your glorious purpose. Give us the grace to choose you, to choose your will above all. And give us the grace to spend one hour with you in prayer every day. We can do it, Father. You know, you know our nature, Lord. But we come to you asking for grace. For the sake of Yeshua, we pray. Amen.